Good afternoon, everybody. Everybody seems deep in thought today. I've got a, a couple of things I want to do here at the top before we get started, and then we'll go to your questions. The first is on a topic that you may not have previously been following, but I wanted to uh, raise with, uh, with this group. Right now, there are 48 nominees for ambassador uh, that are pending and 26 who are waiting on the floor and eligible for uh, confirmation by the full Senate. Uh, the majority of these, those who are waiting are career foreign service officers. These nominees have been waiting an average of 262 days, and these delays are simply unacceptable. It's time Republicans in the Senate ended their obstruction and allowed these qualified individuals to do their important work protecting Amer American interests around the world. In fact, there are currently 70 7 0 nominees to positions impacting our national security, including officials at the, Department of, at the Department of Defense, the State Department, and other foreign focused agencies pending in the Senate. Unfortunately, because of partisan delays by Senate Republicans, these qualified nominees to critical national security posts. Have been, have been forced to put their lives on hold and wait indefinitely to be confirmed. We urge Republicans in the Senate to stop playing political games and let these individuals get to work on behalf of the American people. Fielding a full team abroad is not a partisan priority, it's an American necessity. Uh, and the second piece of news that I have uh, this afternoon is that earlier this morning, the President placed a telephone call to Prime Minister David Cameron. Uh, the two leaders consulted on uh, uh, principally on the uh, current situation in Ukraine. Uh, they also had uh, a brief discussion about the situation in Iraq. Uh, and we'll have a more detailed readout of that telephone call uh, later this afternoon. So with that business out of the way, Darlene, do you want to get us started? Sure, thank you. Uh, a couple of questions on Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, the Russian president said today that the ceasefire there should be extended and coupled with talks between the government and the rebels. I was wondering if the administration sees that as, sees Putin as being genuine when he says that, or is this another situation where you see his words and actions, there a disconnect between what he's saying and what he does? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we do, as we have in the past, welcome any Russian steps to end the crisis in Ukraine, uh, including President Putin's request to the Duma to revoke a resolution authorizing the use of Russian military forces uh, in Ukraine. Uh, we also welcome the separatists' acceptance of the ceasefire and call on them to abide by it. Uh, and we certainly are supportive of any comments from President Putin uh, about the value of a ceasefire agreement. Uh, that said, uh, in the coming days, uh, it's words, not just actions. I'm sorry, it's actions, not just words, uh, that will be critical. Uh, and this is what the President conveyed to President Putin in their telephone call yesterday. The United States remains concerned about the continued presence of Russian forces along the border and pre-positioned heavy weaponry that we believe is intended for separatists. Moving these forces away from the border, ceasing support for separatists, and calling on separatists to continue to abide by the ceasefire and disarm would send a clear signal that Russia is interested in a diplomatic settlement resulting in stability in eastern Ukraine. Um, you know, again, there is an opportunity for President Putin uh, and Russia to play a constructive role in de-escalating the situation in East Ukraine, in Eastern Ukraine. And the constructive role that they can play uh, involves more than just words. It involves tangible actions. Uh, and there's an opportunity for President Putin to, um, to take these actions. Uh, and support uh, the, the de-escalation of the crisis. And if he takes these actions, and if the rebels do enter into talks with the Ukrainian government, does the administration still see the need for additional sanctions against Russia? Well, the goal of sanctions was, uh, was, to do, was to accomplish a couple of things. The first is to further isolate the Russians and put pressure on them to take the kind of action uh, that would be conducive to uh, de-escalating tensions. Uh, in the neighboring country of Ukraine. Uh, obviously, if we start, started to see a change in the behavior um, of, of, the, um, of the Russian government, 
uh, and we saw some concrete steps along the lines that we've been calling for for some time. Um, ending support for the separatists, um, making sure that material and weapons wasn't being provided to the separatists, um, that that would uh, that, that, that would be a positive development, uh, and it would um, make uh, sanction, additional sanctions less likely. Uh, but again, what we're focused here on is not just the words of the, of the Russian president, though we welcome them. What we're focused on are the actions. Okay. Jeff? Follow up on um, yesterday's question about the Exeter Bank. Um, the Wall Street Journal reported about some potential corruption there. Yeah. That's something the White House is looking into and concerned about. And how are you advocating for this on the Hill with that now uh, in the background? Mm -hmm. uh, I'll say two things about that. The first is I, I know that the Export Import Bank has issued a statement saying that they have zero tolerance for waste, fraud, and abuse. Uh, I can assure you that the President of the United States has zero tolerance for waste, fraud, and abuse. Um, I know that the uh, XM Bank is working with the Inspector General, uh, and they take very seriously uh, reports like these. Uh, for additional information about the status of that investigation or for any steps they may be taking over at XM, I'd refer you to uh, the press office over there. Uh, in terms of the XM Bank's overall mission, however, um, I, I think the numbers speak for themselves. Uh, that what we see at the Export-Import Bank is a tangible and important contribution to the U.S. economy. Um, the President has spent a lot of time over the course of this year talking about expanding economic opportunity being the focal point of his domestic policy agenda. Uh, and uh, the efforts of those at, at of the folks at the Export Import Bank to support American businesses as they seek to expand their businesses overseas uh, is important. It makes a tangible contribution to our economy. Uh, it makes a tangible contribution to job creation. Uh, over the last five years, the bank has supported 1.2 million jobs in the United States uh, across a range of sectors, uh, including 200,000 jobs last year alone. There's also important support provided by the XM Bank to American small businesses. Um, about 3,400 American small business transactions were supported by the XM Bank in, in 2013. So um, expanding uh, and strengthening the U.S. economy is a top priority of the President's. Uh, and he does not think that it would be a smart policy decision to start withdrawing support from those institutions that play such an important role uh, in supporting our economy. Uh, I would point out that uh, the President Reagan um, had some similar comments, had a similar view to, the, to this President uh, back in 1986 when he signed legislation uh, extending the, the life of the XM Bank. Uh, I'd also point out that there are a couple of other individuals who are not uh, well known as Obama supporters who have articulated their strong support for the mix mission of the XM Bank and have encouraged uh, the Congress to take bipartisan action to uh, reauthorize it. Uh, let me just read a short quote here from Tom Donahue, who's the President and CEO of the United States Chamber of Commerce, and Jay Timmons, uh, who's the President and CEO of the National Association of Manufacturers. They said, if Exxon is not reauthorized, products of all shapes and sizes, from planes to medical equipment, will still be purchased overseas. They just will not be purchased in the U.S. Or, I'm sorry, they will just not be produced in the U.S. and not by American workers. So the stakes here are pretty high. There is bipartisan agreement. Uh, that uh, there is uh, a tangible contribution that XM is making uh, to the American economy and to American job creation. Uh, and there's bipartisan agreement that needs to be reauthorized. Uh, and we are hopeful uh, that Congress will do what they've done many times in the past, uh, and that is support the reauthorization of the XM Bank uh, in bipartisan fashion. Does it make it harder to press for that when you've got reports about fraud? Mm -hmm. uh, I think the short answer to that is no, simply because, as I mentioned earlier, the numbers speak for themselves. The, re the tangible impact that the Exxon Bank has in our economy and job creation uh, is reason enough uh, for Congress to act in bipartisan fashion, again, as they have many times, to reauthorize the bank. All right, and one other topic. Uh, the Why senior White House and administration officials are meeting tomorrow with uh, Tom Steyer, among mm -hmm. others, about a climate change report. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any misgivings about bringing in a very top and influential political donor to the White House? And do you think that the Keystone Pipeline will come up during those conversations? Uh, I have no misgivings about uh, 
uh, about the individuals who are participating in that meeting. Um, their, their political activities notwithstanding, the administration is committed to, uh, to making progress uh, in addressing the causes of climate change and reducing uh, carbon pollution. That's something that uh, Mr. Steyer has obviously well-known views on. Uh, but there are a lot of other people with well-known views uh, on this that the White House is consulting. Uh, I'd point out that the that well, there are um, there are a number of uh, insurance executives who are here to talk to White House staff uh, today about this very topic. Uh, I would anticipate that many of them, although I don't know this personally, I would assume that many of them have a pretty active political interest, and I would assume that many of the of their political interests may not align perfectly with the uh, administration's agenda. So the point is, we're talking to, uh, to people from a variety of political perspectives. I think the thing that they have in common is uh, they're concerned that failure to address the causes uh, of climate change and the failure to take tangible steps to reduce carbon pollution would have a terrible impact on our country and a terrible impact on our economy. Uh, again, that is something that is, that is a view that's held by Democrats and Republicans alike. Uh, and this administration is willing to work with Democrats and Republicans alike uh, to try to make progress on those goals. Okay, let's move around the room a little bit. Cheryl. Hey, um, following on climate change, though, yesterday the uh, Supreme Court dealt EPA a setback on regulations. What new actions um, is this administration proposing or thinking about in terms of climate change? Mm -hmm. uh, Cheryl, I have to say that I don't think I um, agree with that analysis. Uh, and I think that um, Mr. S uh, Chief Justice, I'm not Chief Justice, I just gave him a promotion, Justice Scalia uh, articulated this a little bit differently. Uh, I don't, I used to have, I had the quote in my book here yesterday, but uh, he basically made the point that um, over the course of the case, the um, EPA was sort of discussing their authority um, to regulate about 86% uh, uh, of their regulatory authority was in question before the court. Uh, and 83 percent of that regulatory authority was upheld by the court. Uh, so we actually see this as a pretty good ratification uh, of the authority that's vested in the EPA to take the kinds of common sense steps that are clearly in the best interest of our country uh, and that are clearly in the best interest of our economy. Uh, you know, the President has talked about this at length. Uh, and I think um, because he has identified this as a priority for his second term, uh, you can anticipate that he's going to continue to be pushing um, members of his administration uh, to take the necessary action to prepare our country for the consequences of, of climate change. Uh, it is the view of this administration and certainly the view of the President uh, that that can be done in a way that's actually good for the economy. Uh, and what we'd be doing is focusing on those areas where we can, um, where we can both uh, you know, make our, our country more resilient, um, where we can reduce uh, carbon pollution, uh, but also uh, strengthen our economy and look for opportunities to capitalize on growth industries. There are countries uh, around the globe that are going to be grappling with the effects of climate change. Uh, and there's an opportunity for our country to play a leading role uh, in terms of capitalizing on, uh, on new industries related to uh, uh, improved efficiency, uh, but also related to uh, renewable energy. Okay. Stephen. Uh, did President um, ask President Putin yesterday to seek this revocation of the Duma's authority to go to Ukraine uh, as, part of, as part of the steps he wants to see to, uh, for the situation to be de-escalated? Stephen, I'm not in a position to offer you a more uh, specific readout of that telephone conversation than you've already seen. But we've been pretty candid, uh, I think, over the last several weeks about the concrete steps that we would like to see President Putin take to de-escalate the situation uh, in eastern Ukraine. Uh, we welcome the, uh, the step that was taken as it relates to the Duma today, uh, but there are some additional concrete steps that we would like to, to see them take as it relates to pulling forces from the border, moving some of that heavy weaponry away so that it can't be transferred into the arm to the hands of, of separatists. There are some tangible steps, and while we welcome uh, those words and those symbolic measures that are taken, <coughs> what we're most focused on right now uh, are concrete steps that Russia can take to support uh, the ceasefire agreement. The State Department yesterday said there were some tanks that appeared to be getting ready to be moved across the border mm -hmm. into eastern Ukraine. Today there was a helicopter shot down by uh, rebels killing a number of Ukrainian soldiers. Does that sort of 
would indicate to the White House that perhaps this may be more window dressing than actual progress? Well, I, th I think that is why we are reserving judgment and trying to make clear that the proper way to evaluate uh, the posture that's adopted by President Putin uh, is to closely examine the actions that are taken uh, by the Russians and the Russian military. Uh, we welcome the positive uh, words, but the, what's critical right now are the actions that are taken uh, by the Russian government to de-escalate the situation. And that involves moving some of that heavy, heavy weaponry that, that you've referenced, Stephen, and making sure that some of that material is not transferred into the hands of separatists so that they can perpetrate additional violence like shooting down helicopters. Mr. Vaquera. Thank you, Mr. Ernest. Uh, when Secretary Kerry was recently in Cairo, uh, he indicated nothing to worry about. The Apache helicopters that the Egyptians want, they're on the way. Uh, the, United, the Secretary has certified that uh, Egypt is moving towards democracy, freeing up some $570 million in aid <coughs> that was held in advance. The $1.5 billion that they get every year appears to be going forward. What leverage, is it all's well that ends well with Egypt? I mean, what leverage does the administration have when they're trying to, when you are trying to move Egypt towards, for example, freeing jail journalists and other, uh, you know, other uh, in, impingements on the dem democracy within Egypt? Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. There's one aspect of your question that I do want to clarify for you, though. The, when we announced earlier this year the resumption uh, of some assistance to Egypt, it was predicated on the certification of two things. Uh, the first is uh, that Egypt was sustaining their strategic relationship with the United States and that Egypt was fulfilling the obligations under the treaty that Egypt has with Israel. Uh, and by certifying those two things, the, that allowed assistance to be reinstated to uh, a couple of things. The first is, and it's about $572 million in assistance. That was directed toward two things. One is support that benefits directly the Egyptian people. Uh, so this is, these are humanitarian uh, items like uh, uh, health and education support and private sector development. The second area of support that that reinstated was, um, was uh, security assistance that's related to the United States core national security interest. So this included assistance to the Egyptian military um, to assist them in securing Egypt's borders, uh, uh, supporting ongoing counterterrorism and anti-proliferation efforts, uh, and helping them to ensure security more broadly in the Sinai Peninsula. So what's left to hold back? Uh, good question. There is additional assistance that remains on hold uh, because Egypt has yet to meet the requirements for reinstatement, including taking steps to ensure a democratic transition. So uh, in your question, you noted that, uh, Secret that Secretary Kerry had certified, according to congressional requirements, that uh, Egypt had met the standard as it relates to fulfilling uh, basic principles of democracy. Uh, the Secretary is not uh, certified to that standard. Uh, and that is why there is some uh, uh, assistance that has been withheld. So the question then is, um, you know, what would we like to see the Egyptian government do? And quite frankly, it's directly related to those principles of democracy that we referred to earlier. Uh, unfortunately, you know, recent developments indicate that uh, Egypt is not taking the kinds of steps that we would like to see uh, toward uh, adopting widely accepted principles of uh, respect for basic human rights and other democratic principles that we hold dear in this country. Uh, but as we continue to evaluate the ongoing situation in Egypt and what impact that should have on the assistance that's provided to Egypt, we'll continue to uh, consult closely with Congress. Okay. Justin. Um, since you brought up ambassadors, uh, I just wanted to get you to respond to the, the charge that's come from Capitol Hill that the reason that a lot of these, there's been delays, it's been the, the administration has kind of forwarded political donors as nominees uh, at a pace that exceeds both the Clinton and Bush administrations. Mm -hmm. and then we've also seen kind of lackluster performances by people like the ambassador nominated Norway, George Sunis, to people like Amy Klobuchar and Al Franken have asked you guys to pull back. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, you know, you kind of blamed Republican obstructionism, but their, their rebuttal is, of course, that you're setting up unqualified political nominees and yeah. how you kind of grapple with, with that. Well, I, I'd say uh, several things about that. First of all, of, of the 26 who are pending on the Senate floor right now, 
16 of them are career foreign service officers. So, uh, I, I'm not, so the objections that you've raised don't explain their obstruction to those 16 con career foreign service officers. Uh, in terms of the other nominees that the president is, has appointed to these positions, we've got full confidence in their ability to do these jobs. Uh, I think it is short-sighted to automatically rule out nominees that aren't career foreign service officers. Uh, if that were the case, that means that Caroline Kennedy would not be serving as the ambassador to Japan. Uh, I think uh, most people, even some Republicans, would agree that she's doing a pretty good job over there. Uh, the President has also appointed people like John Huntsman, uh, the former Republican governor of Utah, uh, to an important uh, ambassador post in China. Uh, again, he is not a career foreign service officer, but uh, again, Democrats and Republicans would agree that he did uh, an able job uh, of representing our country's interests in China. Zeke. Hey, Josh. Uh, in 2011, when the President said that the U.S. was leaving behind a sovereign, stable, and self-reliant Iraq, um, was his assessment wrong at the time of what the situation was on the ground, or was he perhaps sugarcoating uh, the situation on the ground because he, was pulling, he wasn't able to leave that residual force? No, I think what's happened over the course of the last three years is we've seen the circumstances on the ground change. That so much of the sacrifice uh, that was made principally by American uh, servicemen and women in uniform was to create an opportunity for the Iraqi people uh, to seize a democratic future. And you know what we have seen is uh, leadership, political leadership in Iraq that has not done a very good job of capitalizing on that opportunity and unifying that country around a, uh, an inclusive governing agenda. So that's why we've spent a lot of time over the last couple of years uh, urging uh, Prime Minister Maliki and other political leaders in Iraq to pursue a more inclusive agenda. Uh, to confront the existential threat that's posed by ISIL, the nation of Iraq needs to be unified. And there needs to be a sense among every citizen in Iraq, uh, including those who, those in the Shia community, in the Sunni community, and uh, in the Kurd community feeling a, uh, an investment uh, in the success and stability of that country. Uh, that the responsibility for unifying that country starts at the top. Uh, and that's why you know, this administration will continue to support uh, political leaders in Iraq <coughs> who are seeking to, um, to build an inclusive political agenda in that country. With, 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 with regards to those comments, would the President like to revise or extend them? I mean, was, was he wrong about the stability of, the, of that country if it didn't last, you know, even two and a half years, or if these political problems existed even a couple of years ago? Well, no, uh, Zeke, I, I think that anybody who's been looking at this situation that w would acknowledge that the circumstances on the ground have changed. And the necessary steps that are required by the Iraqi political leadership have not been taken to confront those changes. Uh, and that poses a very severe challenge uh, to the nation of Iraq. And it's going to require all of the political leaders of the various communities of Iraq coming together, putting the interests of that unified country first uh, to confront that threat. Uh, there is, I, it is still an open question about whether or not the, the political leadership of that country is going to choose that path. But the, the future of uh, unified Iraq depends upon it. And just to follow up on Jim's question yesterday, is it acceptable to the, uh, to the Obama administration for any sort of partition to be at the outcome of this, of this uh, reconciliation process if there is one? politically, uh, or you know, is the White House insisting on a unified Iraq as the outcome here? Well, it is clearly the policy of this administration in this country that a unified Iraq is the one that is in the best position to confront this ex existential threat from ISIL. But is the alternative acceptable? Well, again, this will have to be a decision that's made by the Iraqi people, but it is the clear policy of this country that we feel like the best way to confront this threat uh, is through a unified Iraq. Uh, that is going to require an investment in uh, a political agenda that gives every Iraqi a stake in that country's future and that country's prosperity. It's also going to require an investment in security forces uh, that reflects the diversity of the country. Again, that security force uh, will be stronger uh, if it reflects the diversity of the country. Again, because uh, if the security force is put in place to defend the security of everybody in that country, uh, they're going to need a, uh, a security force that's composed of individuals from the various communities of that, of that country. And so those are the kinds of investments that this administration has been pushing Iraq's political leadership to, uh, to, uh, to invoke. Okay. Bill. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Secretary Kerry said this morning that to have U.S. aircraft bomb in Iraq before the formation of a new government would be completely wasted. Yesterday, he said that the administration would not have to wait for a new government in order to strike. <coughs> what has changed? Is it now a precondition of U.S. help from the air that there be a new Iraqi government? Right. I think there was uh, the context in which he made those comments was was important. Uh, what Secretary uh, Kerry was talking about is something that I referred to yesterday. Somebody asked uh, if the president was uh, willing to sort of keep op open the option on the table to consider military action in Syria to confront the threat that's posed by ISIL. Uh, what this president has made clear uh, is a willingness to act unilaterally anywhere in the world to protect our national security interests. Uh, that is something that is true uh, in places like Yemen, uh, in Somalia, um, you know, even even in uh, right, but even more recently in Libya. Um, so, in term, when it comes to protecting our core national security interests, the president is willing to use uh, the strongest, most powerful military in the history of the world uh, to protect our national security interests. Now, separately, uh, is a different question, which is a question that's related to: Are we, we is the president willing to use American military might? to stabilize the security situation in Iraq to provide uh, a little room for the Iraqi political leadership to get their act together. Uh, and what we've been very clear about, and what the President himself was very clear about when he spoke uh, in front of the helicopter 10 days ago, uh, was that to take any sort of direct military action along those lines in pursuit of that goal, we would need to see uh, a clear commitment from Iraq's political leaders to the pursuit of an inclusive uh, governing agenda. Because again, there because, has to be a new government. Yeah. because again, the success of this situation, the successful confrontation uh, of the threat that's posed by ISIL, will require a unified Iraq, and that's going to require uh, a government that is pursuing an inclusive governing agenda. So you're basically saying that what Secretary Kerry said this morning is correct, that there wouldn't be U.S. airstrikes before there's a new government in Iraq. Uh, what What I'm saying is that. The President, when he talked about this 10 days ago, was very clear about what criteria he will use uh, in making decisions about the use of our military uh, to protect our national security interests uh, and to uh, support uh, efforts to build and include, to form and build an inclusive uh, Iraqi government. So you're not endorsing what Secretary Kerry said? Well, I, I think what I'm trying to do is be very clear about what our position is and what uh, the policy as articulated by the President is. Uh, and I don't, I, I, I'm not sure that Secretary, I, in fact, I'm confident that Secretary Kerry's comments don't differ from that at all. John? Um, and just to briefly follow up on, on Zeke's question about the comments in 2011, I'd like to focus mm -hmm. on what the President had said. Just this past November, when Maliki was here, uh, in the Oval Office, the President praised Maliki for taking steps in his commitment to, quote, ensuring a strong, prosperous, inclusive, and democratic Iraq, uh, and spoke about how he had done much to bring together the Sunnis, the Kurdish, and Shia. Uh, did the president misjudge Maliki? I mean, that was not 2000. This is just November. Mm -hmm. I haven't looked at the uh, exact comments from the president at that time. I think the president's goal in the uh, in those comments was to encourage the pursuit uh, of a of a governing agenda that reflects the diversity of the country. Uh, that that was the that was the goal of the president's comments when they were sitting in the Oval Office, and that's the goal of uh, uh, of the comments expressed by other senior administration officials. Uh, in terms of encouraging Iraq's political leadership uh, to pursue uh, the kind of agenda and governing style uh, that reflects the diversity of that country. And, and can I ask you again to follow up um, on questions you had last week about the flow of, of children coming over the, the border with Mexico. Um, you were asked and a number of other officials across the administration have been asked uh, how many of those that have been um, uh, caught have been released with a promise to appeal, you know, appear back in court. And you didn't mm -hmm. have that number then. I'm wondering, right. do you have that number now? Uh, I don't have that number in front of me, John. And, but and why, and why? And why don't you have that number? Well, I mean, it's been asked everywhere. It's, it's a number it's, the administration has, right? It's not that. It's not that you don't have it. It's that you don't want to release it, right? Well, I, I don't have it actually, John. I, DHS may have it, but let me just stipulate something. Um, without knowing what that number is and without having seen it. I think we can all stipulate that that number is too high. Uh, and that's why you have seen an investment, uh, a surge, in fact, uh, of resources by this administration to try to address what is a large and growing problem along our southern border. 
Uh, that's why the, uh, we've seen an investment of, of additional judges and asylum officers and ICE attorneys uh, deployed to try to more efficiently and, and rapidly process these cases. Uh, and where necessary, uh, we're opening up additional facilities where adults and adults that are traveling with children can be detained. Um, in conjunction with the opening of those detention facilities are, again, additional uh, ICE officers and, uh, and immigration judges who can process these cases quickly uh, so that if it is determined that these individuals should be removed, uh, that they will be removed promptly as well. In so the interest of transparency, can you get that number for us? Mm -hmm. uh, people have been asking for, you know, for quite some right. time. I, 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 I understand. I think your interest in this is understandable. Uh, I don't have the numbers. But I will stipulate that the number is larger than any of us in this room would like to see. Uh, and what we're focused on is dealing with what is a number that is too big. In terms of the reason for the flow, uh, Cecilia Munoz said that it was increasing violence in Central America. Uh, but today, Jay Johnson was asked if there had been any measurable increase in violence in Central America the last two years. And he said he couldn't say there was. Mm -hmm. So are, are you still saying that that is the reason? Or is the reason, as you had suggested last week, uh, what you call the disinformation campaign by smugglers who say that they can, you know, the children are fine once they get here, they have permission to be here. I think I'd make the case to you that those things aren't mutually exclusive, that there are a lot of people who are trapped in terrible, violent situations in Central America and therefore are a little desperate to try to get out of that situation or are desperate uh, for this, about the safety uh, of their children. And so what it makes them easy targets for criminal syndicates uh, and other individuals with bad intentions to propagate misinformation that gives them false hope about what kind of um, uh, sanctuary they can receive in the United States. The fact of the matter is, people who appear at the southern border expecting to be taken in uh, are mistaken. But are they mistaken? I mean, it's, it's, not our, it's not U.S. policy to send these children back, is it? Uh, sure. I mean, it, so, it, so, so we're, we're, we're deporting these children, unaccompanied children, back to Central America? Uh, it's, the policy is complicated when it comes, uh, if the children are from Mexico, yes, that's exactly what happens. Central America, we're talking is most of this flow, right? Well, it's certainly some of the flow, but you asked me about children who show up at the southern border unaccompanied. Yes, some of them are immediately returned. Uh, others are detained and returned. So they, they go through the immigration process just like everyone else, uh, but there are uh, special accommodations that are required when we're talking about children who show up at the southern border uh, without the, uh, you know, without an adult, without a parent nearby. Uh -huh. So there is a there is a process that we put we put in place. Uh, FEMA is coordinating the response to this effort to to make sure that resources that are marshaled from DHS uh, and HHS uh, are in place to handle the situation. What it, what at its root is a humanitarian situation, uh, but also in a way that is a uh, is in strict compliance with the law. Uh, this administration has demonstrated its, its commitment to enforcing the law, and that's exactly what we're doing. And I suppose you don't have that number of how many have been deported back to Central America. Uh, I do not have that number. Uh, again, I, I would stipulate that that number as well is higher than we would like to see, and that's why you're seeing sort of the stepped-up deployment of resources to deal with it. Jim. Uh, I'd like to jump to the IRS. Uh, the Commissioner, John Koskinen, he's been testifying. Uh, up on Capitol Hill, and one thing that he testi testified I wanted to ask you about, he said that he didn't know about the lost emails uh, from Lois Lerner until April, uh, but then, of course, the IRS did not inform Congress until uh, June. Uh, is that an acceptable level of transparency, do you think? Two months that the commissioner of the IRS knew about these lost emails, but yet Congress wasn't told? Mm -hmm. until June? Well, uh, Jim, I, I can't account for that timeline, so I'd encourage you to direct that question to the IRS. I guess the one thing that does seem no, well, uh, obvious is whether that is acceptable to this White House. Well, well I think the thing that's... Two months to go by. Well, and, I think there's a question that's begged, though, by your construction, which is what would Congress have done had they known about it in April or May or whenever the commissioner first learned about it? The fact of the matter is that this was that there's, there's not anything that is tangibly different about the situation right now. So this administration... So while releasing the information, why was that information Well, again, long? Jim, as I mentioned, you should check with the IRS about this. But the fact of the matter is our commitment to cooperating with legitimate congressional oversight, and in some cases illegitimate congressional oversight, uh, is pretty well documented. Uh, but I'll go through it again because it's pretty Darryl, entertaining. Are you saying Daryl uh, oversight is illegitimate here? Uh, I'm saying that... Uh, there are legitimate questions that can be raised about the partisan motivation of some of those who are conducting oversight in this circumstance. 
The fact of the matter is there have been 17 congressional hearings into this matter, two in the last 17 hours, and three in the last 24 hours. So they've had as many congressional investigations into this in the last 24 hours as I've had meals. Uh, that seems like a lot. Um, 30 interviews with IRS employees, 50 written congressional requests, 750,000 pages of documents. After all of that, after three uh, long congressional hearings in the last 24 hours, zero. That's the other key number here, zero. Zero evidence uh, to substantiate any of the partisan Republican claims about this matter. Isn't the problem, the problem here, though, Josh, is that you have a key figure in this controversy. I think you and I might have different ideas about what the problem is. Well, here's the problem. But the right? problem is that I think the problem is that despite email, all of this, right? despite it's all of this, emails, we have seen like, an unwillingness. Right, but doesn't that sound like the dog ate my homework when you have two years of missing emails? It just, it just on the face of it, doesn't sound credible, doesn't uh, it? I guess if you listen solely to the arguments that are offered up by Republicans, you might have reason to question their credibility. I agree with that. Because the fact of the matter is that despite the, uh, the failure of the hard drive, as has been well chronicled, the fact of the matter is 24,000 emails from that time period uh, have been reconstructed and produced to Congress. Again, because of our commitment to cooperating with congressional oversight in this matter. That's what we've been focused on. So uh, again, I understand why your eyebrows are, right, are raised when you see Republicans on Capitol Hill suggesting that there are two years of missing emails. It's not true. A large chunk of those emails have already been provided to Republicans in Congress. So when they say that, uh, it is an indication, I think, that they're becoming increasingly desperate to try to, um, to try to substantiate the conspiracy theories that they've been propagating for some time now. But again, the key number here is zero. Zero evidence to support uh, the, the claims that are made by Republicans in this matter. And the President's comfortable with the, the level of disclosure and and for all, again, for all the reasons that I cited, 13 months of congressional hearings, 17, um, uh, including three in the last 24 hours, I think that uh, our record of cooperation on this is, um, is probably something you're tired of hearing about right now. But again, it's so long. Just asking the question. That, um, but, but the White House is also comfortable with the TIGDA, uh, people at TIGDA looking into the missing emails. That's Well, I think that's appropriate. TIGDA is the inspector general and they're independent, so uh, I wouldn't render a judgment on, on their activities. And, I don't think it'd be appropriate for me to, and um, they're independent. So, Mr. Nakamura. Yes, I just want to follow up on uh, John's questions about immigration. Um, okay. The Associated Press today reported that the uh, Homeland Security Department and the White House have, and I quote from the story, so far dodged the answer to the question about um, how many <coughs> minors have received notices to appear and, not, and, and it actually showed up. Mm -hmm. And so far dodged the answer on at least seven occasions over two weeks, uh, alternately saying they did not know the figure or did not have it immediately at hand. The Associated Press concludes, I mean, concludes from that in this story, quote, this is how it looks when the image conscious Obama administration doesn't want to reveal politically sensitive information that could influence an important policy debate. How would you respond to that? Is that, is that accurate that okay. you're concerned those numbers would, would inflame uh, the situation at the time you're trying to get immigration reform going? No, I, I think what I would um, indicate, David, is that we would stipulate to the fact that the numbers that you're seeking uh, are higher than anyone would like them to be. Uh, and so the real question before this administration, I think before the American people, when they consider the reaction of their government is, what are they doing about numbers that are bigger than they should be? Uh, and in this case, we have taken a number of steps to surge resources to try to address this problem, both in a way that reflects the humanitarian situation uh, that is having a, a negative uh, effect on some in otherwise innocent children, uh, but also in a way that uh, reflects our nation's commitment to being a nation of laws. Uh, this administration is committed to enforcing the law, uh, and that's why you've seen the steps taken uh, that we have. Uh, I think the one additional thing here that's also important to recognize is we're also taking some additional steps uh, to try to uh, address this problem at its root. Uh, the Vice President took a trip to Central America and met with leaders of Central American countries just last week to make sure that um, that, the all, that those countries, the leaders of those countries, were doing the things that were required of them to safeguard their population. Uh, the, the Vice President also announced on that trip some additional steps that the United States could take to support those countries as they try to uh, reduce violence uh, and address other measures related to citizen security, uh, but also to make sure that people are aware of, of the facts. Uh, and the fact is that showing up uh, unannounced uh, at the uh, southern border with the United States will not uh, gain you legal entry into this country. I could just follow up on one thing. It looks like Speaker Boehner's office has announced a working group 
uh, of seven Republicans uh, to inform what he says inform uh, House leadership uh, about this situation on mm -hmm. the border because, quote, the president has failed to take the necessary steps to address the crisis. Is that an appropriate response by House Republicans because they, you, the White House like to see them really engaged in this? Or do you worry that this kind of working group with seven Republicans would potentially complicate matter, U.S. response by politicizing? Mm -hmm. I have, I've, I, I'm not sure when that announcement was made. It's the, your mention of it is the first I've, I've heard of it. So I wouldn't pass judgment on it from here without uh, uh, having reviewed it more carefully. Uh, if there are uh, Republicans who do want to play a constructive role in, uh, in addressing uh, what is a complicated uh, and difficult uh, policy challenge, we certainly would welcome uh, their constructive contribution to those efforts. Okay. Christy. Sure. Thank you. Yes. Um, on the review that Jay Johnson was doing before the delay that the president requested, is he continue? Was it his plan to continue doing that review over the summer? And uh, if so, has this gotten has this interrupted the review that he was doing of humane practices in yeah. deportation policy? Uh, it's my understanding that that review is still ongoing, uh, but I would encourage you to check with the Department of Homeland Security for an update. If I, I don't know if they'll be able to provide you with one, but they'd be in a better position to do so than I am. You also say if the White House has seen any signs that Republicans are using the window of opportunity that the President was hoping they would do, yeah. as the President was hoping they would do this summer. Sadly, no. Alexis. I want to go back to Bill's question just to clarify <coughs> uh, on Iraq. Um, in terms of the trigger, what would trigger potential airstrikes, I didn't quite understand the President when he was speaking to say that he was segregating the two things, a long-term uh, more inclusive government and the potential to try to uh, deal with the crisis with airstrikes. So can I just clarify, is the President saying that he would not use them under any circumstances unless the Iraqi government moves forward and shows some signs, or would he use them to defend Baghdad or to defend the embassy? I, I, I wasn't my understanding that that's what he was trying to convey. Right. Uh, I, I'm not going to be in a position to sort of prejudge what he may or may not conclude. I would encourage you to go back and take a look uh, at his comments that he delivered, I guess it was a week ago, Friday. Uh, I think that he was pretty clear in suggesting that there is not going to be uh, a military solution to the instability that we see in Iraq right now. What's going to be required is a political solution that unites the country to face the threat that's posed by ISIL. Um, and what, what may assist that effort uh, is, a, uh, is military support from the United States. Uh, that would uh, stabilize the security situation uh, and give that government a little bit more room to act and unify the country. Uh, but what the President, I think, was pretty clear about is his, um, his uh, view that because political action will be required uh, uh, in terms of unifying the country, we'll need to see a commitment uh, along those lines uh, before uh, uh, a decision is made about direct military action or other uh, other increases in our support for that government. Would you, is it too much to say it's conditional? The president is conveyed to the Iraqi government. It's conditional because they have obviously made a formal request for military intervention, airstrikes. Yeah. Is that going too far to say that the president is conveyed to them? It's conditional. Well, I, again, I, I don't want to read out any sort of detailed in a detailed manner any private conversations that this administration has had. Uh, you know, with our counterparts in Iraq. Uh, but again, I would, I would encourage you to take a look at the President's remarks from a week ago Friday, and I think he was pretty specific about what he had in mind. Okay. Peter. Josh, uh, you mentioned the stepped-up deployment of resources to the border. Uh, could that uh, at any point uh, include National Guard troops, as some of the Republicans have been calling for, including in today's uh, hearing with Secretary Johnson? Yeah. If I said that, I may have been a little bit imprecise. I think what I was trying to suggest is that uh, resources had been mobilized to deal with the problem at the border, right? In some cases, these detention centers are being opened up in other communities a little bit away from the border, but they're all rooted in trying to deal with the problem what at the border. What are the prospects so, for the National Guard becoming involved in this? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the President has made a historic commitment to deploying resources to secure our border. Uh, that is both in, in the form of technology and in the form of personnel. Uh, and. I think one thing is, that's particularly ironic among some Republicans on Capitol Hill who are suggesting that uh, additional resources should be deployed to the border. Uh, in many cases, those are the same congressional Republicans who are blocking common sense immigration reform legislation passed by the Senate that, wait for it, 
included a historic commitment of resources to the United States border. So if we really wanted to solve this problem, one good way to do it would be for those Republicans to get on board uh, and do what so many Republicans did in the United States Senate, which is support common sense immigration reform that wouldn't just secure our border, but would actually do good things for our economy, would re reduce the deficit, uh, and finally deal with an immigration system that everyone agrees is broken. So you're ruling out the use of the National Guard in this immediate crisis? Mm -hmm. What I'm suggesting is that there has already been a historic commitment of resources to the border. And if there are, are Republicans in Congress who are focused on increasing uh, resources along the border, that they should uh, jump on board the uh, bandwagon uh, and support the passage of comprehensive immigration reform. Okay? Let's see. Ann. Thank you. Uh, according to a video that the White House has posted online, the President's going to travel around this summer and start visiting some of the people who have written him. Is this because he doesn't think he really understands what's going on in people's <laughs> lives, or is he just going a little stir crazy in the last couple of years in Washington? Well, and one of the things, I think somebody asked me, Tamara, I think you may have asked me a little bit about this yesterday. I might have. Uh, as I recall. The, one of the things that the President believes is important uh, is making sure that he is paying uh, careful attention to the way that people all across the country uh, are dealing with so many of the challenges uh, that are facing working families right now. That's one of the reasons that the, the White House hosted uh, the first ever Working Family Summit here in Washington. Um, but the President is also uh, interested in getting outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, and spending time with, uh, with Americans in their, in their day to day routines uh, and talking to them about the challenges that are confronting their family, uh, their small business, or their communities more broadly. Uh, and so this is one, one way for the President to break out of that presidential bubble that so many other presidents have talked about. Uh, go their homes, go with them to the office. Yeah. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll have some more details about the President's activities on Thursday. Uh, but, you know, it's something that's that... It's a one-time thing. He's going to do this repeatedly? That's right. That's right. And I think it, that, this, that the President's efforts to spend time walking in the shoes of, uh, of average Americans will take uh, some different forms. Uh, in the case of, uh, of the Minnesota trip here, though, I think there's... Um, let's see. I thought I had some more information. He's going to do a town hall meeting, uh, and he's going to spend some time meeting with um, the, uh, Rebecca's family. Rebecca is the woman from Minnesota who had written the President that letter. Um, uh, so this will be an opportunity for him to, to talk to Rebecca, to talk to her family, to talk to people in her community uh, about the range of challenges that they're facing. And uh, this will hopefully be an opportunity for the President to get some additional insight uh, into um, the challenges that those, uh, that those families are confronting on a regular basis, but also get some insight into uh, how those families are benefiting from some of the policies or would benefit from some of the policies that the President and his administration have proposed. Okay, move around a little bit. Jared. Josh, is uh, talking about the diplomatic note and the assurances that the President got from the Iraqi government, is the bar for assurance lower because the United States government is unsure what state the Iraqi government might be in, in when, if and when they ever need to prosecute American troops? Mm -hmm. Let me um, pull this up here. Uh, Jared, the President has made clear that we need to address the status of any military personnel sent into Iraq in response to the Iraqi government's request for assistance to address the crisis. Um, so Iraq has provided the exchange of acceptable assurances on the issue of protections for these personnel via the exchange of diplomatic note. Uh, specifically, Iraq has committed itself to providing protections for our personnel equivalent to those provided to personnel who were in the country uh, before the crisis. Uh, and we believe, the President believes, that those protections are adequate to the short-term assessment and advisor mission that our troops will be performing. So the, the fact that there's a lowered bar is only because of the size and scope of the mission? Well, I, I think what we're seeing now is a, is a situation that's different in character and in kind than we saw in 2011. Uh, and those differences are that we're dealing with a rather urgent situation uh, when it comes to the threat that's posed by ISIL. The number of military personnel that we're talking about is on a much smaller scale. It's a small number of advisors that we're discussing here. There's been a clear uh, request from the Iraqi government. Uh, and as a result uh, of those, that dynamic, those three things, the emergency situation, the small number of, of advisors, and the request from the Iraqi government, we've received the uh, appropriate assurances from them. And when we're talking about re uh, responses to the emergency, we've seen Secretary Kerry there. We've seen other, uh, other reaching out. 
it, would a leader-to-leader -leader call at this point give too much credibility to a Maliki government that might not be there much longer? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't want to speculate on, uh, on any uh, calls that the President hasn't made at this point. Uh, but we'll keep you updated as best we can on causing I mean, it's actually about the optics. So whether or not they've been made or not is irrelevant to whether or not they're being talked about and whether you've shown them. That's what's the question. So the fact that we haven't heard about them is, is substantive in this, for the question. Okay. Then maybe I don't understand the question. If you aren't showing us the calls, is it because you don't want us to know that they're that the president's talking with a leader who might not be around? I see. That's a clever way of asking the question. Why don't I just say this? I, I I'm not, I'm not aware of any conversations that have taken place in recent days from the President and Prime Minister Maliki, but there have been a number of, at least two that I can recall off the top of my head here, from the Vice President to Prime Minister Maliki in the last few days. Okay. Let's see. Luis. On the um, case of uh, Miriam Ibrahim, the Sudanese woman who was uh, sentenced to hang for apostasy, uh, she was released. Uh, but then we have reports that uh, she and her family were arrested at the airport while trying to uh, leave the country. Um, that family includes her husband, who's a U.S. citizen, and there are reports that they were trying to head to the United States. Mm -hmm. um, is uh, the administration following this case, and is it concerned about it? Yeah. The administration is, is following the, ca the case quite closely. Uh, in fact, as Secretary Kerry himself said just yesterday, that we welcome the decision by the Sudanese uh, appeals court um, to order her release. Um, this case has rightly drawn the attention of the world and has been of deep concern to this administration uh, and to people all across the globe. Uh, we've seen the troubling reports of her rearrest, but are not in a position to confirm them at this point. Uh, we urge the government of Sudan in the strongest terms to ensure her freedom uh, and more broadly to respect uh, its citizens' inherent right to the freedom of religion. Okay? Yes? Uh, thank you, Josh. Uh, <coughs> The, uh, I want to go back to uh, the president's conversation yesterday. Uh, when the president makes uh, this call, uh, is his purpose more uh, to convey something to, uh, to the Russian president or to maybe get some information in return to learn something? Uh, does he feel as if he is making progress on both of those fronts? That he understands, in line with uh, what Anne was asking for about the president understanding the situation in his own country, that, 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 that does he feel that he has a complete understanding of uh, what's going on in Ukraine, for instance, and especially the grievances, the legitimate grievances of the people in the east and the south of that country? I think you and I may have a different assessment about the legitimacy of some of those grievances, uh, to put it mildly. but. Uh, I will say this, that the President uh, has spoken many times to President Putin, uh, and the President himself has talked about the business-like nature uh, of the conversations that those two leaders have. Uh, the President certainly respects uh, the legitimate uh, interests uh, that Russia has in the region, uh, but the President is also concerned about making sure that everybody respects uh, the, the, the sovereignty and territorial integrity of independent nations. Uh, so there has been a um, you know, a, a pretty open channel of communication between President Obama and President Putin uh, in relation to this issues, but also a range of other issues as well. And, uh, you know, so whether it's, you know, talking about Ukraine uh, on the phone yesterday or having the opportunity to visit about this uh, in person when they were both in Normandy a few weeks ago, uh, the President is interested in having a, an open and businesslike dialogue with President Putin. And that there's no doubt about uh, that in, in certain situations that there's a, a difference of opinion uh, when it comes to some, uh, I think, uh, what are pretty basic facts to others uh, around the globe who might have a more impartial view. Uh, but that doesn't, and I think this is an important part of the relationship between the United States and Russia, uh, it doesn't inhibit cooperation on other important uh, national security priorities that both countries share. One great example of that uh, uh, is the success of the OPCW effort uh, to remove the declared chemical, wa chemical weapons arsenal uh, of the Assad regime. Uh, that would not have happened without the uh, cooperation and support uh, of the Russian government and other countries in the international community. So that's an indication that despite the uh, differences of opinion we may have about Ukraine, that the robust relationship between the United States and Russia uh, isn't just good for our two countries, it's good for the world. Thank you, Josh. And on, on a slightly less weighty matter, 
Uh, did the World Cup come up in their conversation? Did <laughs> President Putin congratulate President Obama on the amazing, amazing performance by the American team in the World Cup? <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't say the same about my side. <laughs> but uh, is, does he watch uh, those performances? Did he watch the match with uh, Portugal? Is, uh, does he intend to watch the match with uh, Germany? Yeah. Uh, I have not spoken to the president about the, uh, about the soccer match. Uh, I know that he's aware of the outcome and is very proud uh, of, what we, of a couple of strong performances by the U.S. men's national team. Uh, and I don't know if he'll have a chance to watch the Germany game or not. I think that we're scheduled to be on the road that day. Uh, but, um, but I know that the president is very proud of the performance of the team so far and uh, is optimistic about their continued success. Uh, Chris, I'm going to give you the last one. Thanks, uh, Josh. Um, on the planned executive order uh, that the president is planning to sign, uh, barring LGBT discrimination among federal contractors, not a lot of information is known either about its scope or the timing, either for signing or implementation. That would be a first. Um, yes. Right? Uh, it seems like you've known quite a bit about this all along. Well, uh, I haven't known anything. I'm asking you about it. Okay. Bit. So um, the, what I want to ask, though, is that there's a lot of concern about uh, possibly a religious exemption being placed mm -hmm. within the executive order. Mm -hmm. Could you rule out the possibility that a religious, religious exemption will be within the executive order? Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not in a position from here to give you any greater insight about the contents uh, of what an executive order uh, like this might include. Uh, but this is something that the President's team is drafting, uh, and once they have finished the drafting of that and are ready, to, ready for the President to sign it, uh, we'll be able to talk to you a little, in a little bit more detail about what's actually included in there and what the consequences are for the President's signature. Is the White House waiting for the U.S. Supreme Court to rule on the Hobby Lobby case before I'm settling on a final form of executive order? Uh, it's my understanding that there, uh, there's an ongoing process as it relates to the, to the drafting of an executive order that would uh, take the kinds of steps the President's talked about quite a bit. Uh, but at this point, I, I don't have any update for you in terms of the content or the timing of that executive order. Why is the White House announcing that the President is going to sign the executive order at this time when that could have happened any time over the course of the five and a half years of the administration? Okay. Oh, goodness. Okay. <laughs> Get some water. Why don't we uh, Why don't we wrap it up and we'll uh, bring some water out here. <laughs>